Just last week, I was invited to give two different versions of this talk to slightly different audiences. It's 16 to 18 year old school kids and then uh, undergraduates doing their degrees and trying to adapt the content to those new audiences got me thinking that this could actually serve as quite a good general introduction to the concept that I want to share. So this is AI ethics versus the real world. A little bit about me. I've been working in tech for about 20 years now, um, initially in kind of marketing and comms and through to digital strategy in the early days of social media and more recently in product development, product management and general startup uh, operational practice. Um, so I consider myself to be quite experienced in the area of product innovation. In more recent years, uh, the startups I've worked with have been increasingly involved in AI as it becomes more popular. A particular note, I spent five years as Chief Operations Officer of a startup here in Belfast, trying to develop what you could call empathic AI, that is, tools that attempt to, to measure the way people are feeling in all kinds of different environments. And we got to work on some very cool projects in the process of that um, with extreme sports and autonomous vehicles and all sorts. But it also exposed us very clearly to some of the ethical challenges that come with these powerful technologies. More recently, uh, for the last five years or so, I've been working on developing new global standards for ethical AI, uh, in particular in the area of empathic AI, but also more generally. And this has really exposed me to a lot of concepts around philosophy, ethics, and good practice, as well as policy and other things. A quick warning for this talk, there will be some philosophy. There will be some questions uh, which you will need to consider and I will want you to try and decide in some cases uh, on which way uh, you think things should go. But don't worry, the good thing about philosophy is there's no such thing as a wrong answer. So let's start our first thought experiment. Imagine you're walking alone far from anywhere and you discover a ring. You place it on your finger and then poof, you disappear. You can no longer be heard or seen. You are essentially invisible to everybody and whatever you do will have no consequence uh, for you. You'll never be caught. The question, of course, is what do you do? Imagine, for instance, if there's a, somebody out there in the world, perhaps a political figure, um, such as a, a, someone in a leading position of power who you disagree with, would you go and sneak into the place where they are and stop them from what they're doing, try to change them. Of course, uh, no government would ever allow you to behave in that way. It's, it would be illegal. In particular, what this thought experiment does is it asks you to think about virtues. Virtues being the, the sort of principles and values and things that you hold within yourself to be true and that you think are important. In the case of this ring of invisibility, you could be guided by these virtues to act in a particular way. So the question that we are being asked here is, should we or can we act just according to the virtues that we hold to be true, whether those are justice or reasoning or courage, or should we act according to rules, regardless of what we hold to be virtuous? Surely also consequences are important too, the consequences of our actions, you know, what will actually happen if we conduct them. So this moves us on to our second thought experiment, another very famous one. This is the trolley problem. Trolley here meaning streetcar or train basically. Uh, here you can see uh, in the image a train that is moving along some tracks and you are the blue character at the top standing next to a lever. If you do nothing then the train will continue to follow the green track along to the left-hand side, that is track A. If, however, you choose to push the lever, 
the train will switch tracks onto track B on the right hand side, the pink track, and head down there. In the case of you doing nothing and the train going down track A, you see that there are three people tied to the track further down. All three of them will perish. If, however, you choose to push the lever and switch to track B, um, another person who's tied to track P will, will, will die. So you've chosen to kill that one person for the sake of saving the lives of three. This is the classic thought experiment. Uh, when I've asked audiences to vote, generally speaking, they choose to push the lever and go for B, but not unanimously. Some people would prefer to do nothing. Okay, so what this asks us to do is to weigh up the pros and cons, the costs and benefits in a particular situation. But as we can see, even from this simple example, there's no moral decision that comes as just a simple calculus. Uh, it's not a simple case of A or B and everything's going to be okay. So let's try another thought experiment now. Let's break the rules. One rule that we should all be familiar with from a very early age is that it's bad to steal, right? It's illegal to steal. Now this is an adaptation of another famous thought experiment, which I will just read out from the screen now. <clears throat> Jamie's wife has been diagnosed with a rare condition. Her health could be greatly improved with a special new medical device. The device is only available from one company who hold a monopoly on it and demand a high price. It's far more than Jamie can afford. Jamie pleads with the company's founder to drop his price, but the founder says, no, it's our invention and we deserve to profit from it. Jamie asks his friends and family for help, but still can't raise nearly enough money. One night, in desperation, Jamie sneaks past the company's security and steals one of the medical devices from their warehouse to treat his wife. The question here, of course, is, is Jamie justified in his actions? Is it okay in this life or death situation to steal, to break a rule. Okay, so we can see here that rules can keep us on the right path, but as shown in the thought experiment, there's no such thing as a universal rule that's always right in all cases. So now you're a philosopher. The three thought experiments we just conducted are designed to help us have an insight into the three key frameworks of normative ethics or of moral philosophy. Um, there are many others, but these probably are the three big hitters. Firstly, we had virtue ethics. So this is the idea of the virtues that we carry around inside ourselves that tell us how we should be, how we should behave, what kind of person we want to become. And the ring of invisibility thought experiment that we did was just an adaptation of the well-known ring of Gijes or Gijes. I don't know how you pronounce that. Secondly, we looked at consequentialism, another big ethical framework. And a subset of that that is very well known is utilitarianism. In this case, we use the trolley problem to uh, frame our thought experiment. And here we were considering the outcomes of our actions, that is the consequences of what we do or think. And lastly, we looked at the idea of deontology, which is a fancy word, uh, but deon is just literally the Greek for duty. It means our duty to follow rules, our duty to be a good member of society and so on. And in this case, uh, what we did is we looked at an adaptation of what's called Heinz's dilemma. So continuing in this style of thought experiments, essentially, consider this very simple tool, a hammer. What could it be used for? Of course, it could be used for good. You could use it to put up a wall or repair something to provide shelter for your friends and family. And of course, it could be used for bad. It could be used to harm someone, for instance. And if it's used in either way, who's to blame? I think most people would probably agree that you can't blame the hammer. We couldn't say that it has any agency, uh, even though it is the one doing the damage, because it's just a dumb object that has no mind. And uh, the person holding it is clearly responsible for the actions and the consequences of the hammer. So then let's ask another question. Another simple one here. What would you like for breakfast? You can choose one, your full fry, two, the porridge, three, a slice of toast, or four, one of those on the go yogurt pots.
The idea here is to show that even in the simplest question and the simplest decision, there are values that you carry around in those decisions. In the case of this one, for instance, option one, it might have been indulgence. You might have thought um, it'd be nice to have a big hearty breakfast. Or two, you might have chosen the healthy option because you're concerned about your health. Or three, maybe saving money or time. And four, perhaps you chose that because you want to get your meal on the go and get to work on time and be more productive. So why are we asking all this? Well, going back to the hammer, the old expression, a bad worker blames their tools. We have to consider where the agency lies in the system. And when I say system, I mean a person and a hammer is a system. It's a technological system. And we have to work out who's responsible at what, and at what stage in the design of the system. And secondly, if we uh, take the idea that decision making is never value th free, there are always values in every decision we make, then we can put these things together and consider a new context. That is smart systems, digital systems, in other words, AI. Fundamentally, AI um, are systems that make automated decisions. So at this point, we have to ask, does AI have values of its own? Does it have agency? And if it does have agency, is it to blame? Can you say that uh, the system itself, the digital system, or perhaps the business that um, owns it rather than any particular human is responsible? Who's responsible? Who's to blame? Should we ever punish artificial systems? Okay, so this is sum up some of the things we've talked about here. We've largely been looking at the area of ethics called normative ethics. Norms, essentially meaning rules or agreed kind of forms of behavior. If you think about what a social norm is, it's the way that we all tend to, tend to behave. And these are norms for how to think or decide or act. They say things like, do this, don't do that. Or if this, then that. And now machines, smart machines are rule-based. AI is basically based on algorithms and algorithms are essentially, to put it simply, rule sets. They say, if this, then that. Okay, so maybe we've solved the whole problem here. If we could just take our own rules our own norms and then apply them to machines, then maybe we've got everything we need. And this is the essence of machine ethics, which is, I suppose, a subset of the broader kind of AI ethics field. But of course, as with all these things, we run into problems. And now we go into another well-known thought experiment. This time uh, it invites us to imagine that we have created a machine and we've given it one single objective function is the right term. We've given it one single thing for it to do, and that is simply to build paper clips. And then we leave the machine running, uh, and what it does is it keeps on working away at its function, building paper clips, and then eventually it works out that it can maybe recruit other machines to help, and then it can recruit further resources from elsewhere. And then eventually, if you just keep on going and it keeps on uh, trying to achieve its, achieve its objective function, then eventually, um, perhaps it'll just take over the entire planet and turn the whole thing into a paperclip, a paperclip factory. And here's uh, GPT's attempt at uh, drawing what a giant universal paperclip factory would look like. Okay, so with all these experiments in mind, let's move on to some real world situations. Remembering the trolley problem thought experiment where we had the train coming down the track and we could choose whether to let it go down track A or track B. In the world of uh, training autonomous vehicles, that is self-driving cars, we face this problem potentially um, in, in the real world. Say a pedestrian steps out in front of a car, what's the car going to do once it detects the presence of the pedestrian, especially if it realises that it's not going to be able to stop in time and either it'll have to kill the pedestrian or swerve and then potentially cause some other kind of incident. And in fact, you can go and play with different variations of this particular real life trolley problem if you go to The Moral Machine. It's a, um, a website created by MIT Media Lab. And here you have these A or B scenarios. In this particular case, I think what's going on here is in A on the left, you've got the pedestrians that have stepped out in front of the car are just regular people. There's two of them. And there's two people in the, in the vehicle. There's two, a driver and a passenger. And you can either choose that the machine will continue straight forward and kill the pedestrians or it'll swerve and hit the barrier and then kill the driver and passenger. In an alternate version, 
um, where I, the par parameters have been adjusted. This one's a little bit kind of sinister, to be honest, um, as if all this talk of death wasn't bad enough in the first place. What we have here, I think, is a robber and a homeless person in option A, or swerve and kill a doctor in um, option B. And let's do one more then. This one is the biggest question of all, the one that uh, is going to cause the most amount of moral crisis and challenge. Cat or dog? Would you choose to kill the cat or kill the dog? Okay, so let's try and make this even more um, grounded in a reality that we can at least imagine, if not actually witness. So if you had, to, if you were buying an autonomous vehicle for you and your family, say, and you had a choice, two different versions of the same vehicle, both of them are identical in every way, same price, same uh, specs, same hardware, same everything, except they both have a slightly different firmware embedded in them. And in version A, the software is designed to prioritize the driver and passengers. That is, um, it would swerve, uh, it, it wouldn't swerve, it would kill the pedestrians in the case of our classic uh, trolley problem. Or version B, it's designed to prioritize the pedestrians, in which case it would swerve, hit the barrier and kill the driver and passenger. And you could even say that these two versions of this imaginary vehicle are representative of two different um, broad ethical um, types in cultures that we see where the first one is more individualistic and the second one is more collectivist or socialist and in a sense the first one is more kind of western and the second one is more eastern just to generalize very very broadly which one would you buy so to recap on this section we haven't gone deeply into the way that different ethical frameworks are presented, but we have looked at them quite quickly and we've looked at ways to apply them. We looked at virtue ethics, about how we should be or behave or become. We looked at consequentialism, where we consider the outcomes of our actions. And we looked at deontology, where we looked at the duty to follow rules and behavior. I would also add two other ethical frameworks that I think are instructive to um, how we think about running modern businesses and, and building technology that are maybe not as well known um, and are more modern. And that is care ethics, firstly. Care ethics, I think, stems out of the feminist movement, um, largely. And what it does is it asks us to look at not so much um, how an, in, an individual person should do or think, or even what rules we should generate to um, decide that, but instead it says we should consider the interpersonal relations between people and between people and things and then look at other people's individual needs, not so much at our own. And that can be summarized um, with a key em uh, focus on empathy. That is, you know, feeling for and caring for other people. And then in the second one here, we have pragmatic ethics. I think also it's known as moral pragmatism. And this is almost like a, a sort of scientific approach to philosophy and ethics. What this does is it says that actually um, our situations change and we gather data as we go and we learn and no single uh, ethical framework can be perfect or correct. So instead what we should do is we should look for evidence and um, create hypotheses that can be validated or argued against by that evidence and continuously refine our position on our ethics. So now let's switch tracks, as it were, um, and consider the other sort of perspective on which I, I want to, to take us through this journey today, which is from business. And in particular, the dichotomies, that is the kind of contradictions and challenges that are faced by businesses when uh, we consider the, the ethics of how they behave. Now here's a famous figure, perhaps you can name this person. This is of course Mark Zuckerberg, founder, chairman and CEO of Facebook and then more latterly Meta. And in the early days of Facebook, there was this motto. Um, and I admit being in the tech startup world at the time, I think this was quite a trendy and cool thing that you used to say and it kind of seemed right at the time, which was this idea of move fast and break things. 
it invited an attitude of not being afraid to fail, of being experimental, of trying stuff out, and um, uh, you know, prioritizing moving forward than you know, getting bogged down in things. More recently, they changed it, I believe, to move fast with stable infrastructure, which is just boring, and I wanted to point that out, how boring that was. But look, let's fast forward a few years and see when things started to come crashing down. Here's the same character um, in a public trial uh, after the Cambridge Analytica scandal and uh, not so happy. And um, this motto of move fast and break things has become um, a sort of expression that is used to point out all the things that are wrong with the Silicon Valley style uh, attitude, or sort of arrogance of um, just building things without taking time to consider their uh, potential consequences and, and outcomes. So if moving fast and breaking things is the wrong way to go, then all we have to do is slow down, right? That should solve the whole problem. And in fact, this letter from March 2023, I think, um, exemplifies this idea of slowing things down. This was a um, public open letter that was released that was asking um, for the large scale AI, such as um, LLMs, large language models, to be paused for a while while we figured out the correct rules and approaches for doing so. And it should be noted that among the many well known signatories on this letter, there were included the founders of some well known uh, technology companies. But is that really going to work? Uh, while there's merit in attempting to slow down, it may not be realistic. In a competitive market, the slow, cautious approach is generally considered to be the losing approach anyway. Um, if one nation takes the time to consider things carefully, another one might rush ahead and um, beat it to the, to, the, to the market in this new you know, area of technology. And in fact, I suspect we never even hear about the more cautious companies that come about because they just don't make it out into the market. And this idea of kind of speed versus damage is just one example of the kind of dichotomies that businesses uh, face all the time. Um, another one would be regulation versus innovation. Should we set rules and laws for our um, technologies or should we allow a kind of Wild West approach of um, people just building whatever they want and innovating freely? Um, should we allow services to become dominant, um, like Google is dominant for search or Amazon is dominant for online shopping? Or should we try to restrict uh, what could become monopolistic and try to invite greater variation and competition? Um, this last one, openness versus vulnerability, gets at the idea that some organizations take a more open approach, for instance, um, uh, providing access to the source code of their tools. But this kind of openness could um, generate a kind of vulnerability, vulnerability to competition, vulnerability to um, uh, cyber security attacks, these kinds of things. So let's now look at some real life case studies of uh, ethical AI problems. This one in March 2018 um, was of a, an Uber vehicle, a test vehicle for Uber that was um, driving an autonomous vehicle and then they had what they call a, um, a safety driver at the wheel who's supposed to watch what's going on and then intervene if necessary. And sadly, uh, the driver wasn't paying attention. They were looking down at their phone um, they've probably been sitting in the car for a very long time uh, with nothing happening, I imagine. Um, they got distracted and unfortunately um, a lady by the name of Elaine Hertzberg stepped out into the road uh, pushing her bike. The vehicle failed to recognise the situation and the driver failed to act in time and Elaine Hertzberg was killed. One of the things that I think is particularly interesting to ask about this case from our current perspective of, of how do we apply ethics to business and innovation, is that the US federal government, I think it was, immediately banned testing of autonomous vehicles while they looked into the situation. Um, and 
this continued in some cities for several months, um, right up until December of that year in some cases. Now, the World Health Organization estimates that um, there's over a million fatalities on the road each year. And the research tells us that about 90% of those are due to human error. At the same time, we don't know yet, I don't think, exactly how safe self-driving cars will be, but the evidence seems to be piling up to say that they are generally much safer than humans. So if that's the case, and if therefore putting autonomous vehicles on the roads will save hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives um, year on year, what damage could have been caused by pausing the testing of autonomous, autonomous vehicles due to the death of one single person? Now, I'm not saying that the government was wrong or right. I'm just asking uh, a sort of utilitarian question, as it were, a, a calculus that is very difficult to make. Another uh, type of technology that has gained a lot of controversy is that of facial recognition or facial analysis. Um, cameras are ubiquitous now. They're all over public and private spaces. And without having to adapt the hardware, the actual camera, you can apply software to the video feed to, to analyze it, to do things like try to recognize and identify people or to spot certain facial features and make estimates such as how old they are, um, what their gender is, um, how they're feeling, for instance, or even make predictions about their behavior, such as whether they're going to commit a crime. Without getting into it too much, the technology is fundamentally flawed. There are some serious issues around the foundational theories upon which it's based, such as physiognomy, this idea of being able to guess a person's personality from their, um, their face shape, and even just some pretty fundamental things like about um, how our emotions work um, and how they're represented in our, um, in our faces. And as you can see from the pictures here, this was uh, just a demo I took online um, where it was trying to estimate my mood. And I was essentially spoofing it by creating archetypal facial expressions. And sure enough, it correctly uh, estimated what my expression was based on the shape of my face. But it didn't in any way correctly estimate how I was actually feeling because I wasn't actually feeling particularly happy or surprised or angry. We've seen some awful cases of um, ethnic bias and other biases embedded in the data sets upon which these, these, this software is built um, and other technical issues that end up leading to a much lower rate of accuracy and way more false negatives um, for people of color, for instance, and other uh, minority groups, uh, as well as women. And this can lead on to some very serious problems, especially when it gets adopted in high stakes environments, as has happened, for instance, with um, some UK police departments who've trialed it um, on uh, companies that have been using facial analysis to hire candidates and on schools, for instance, in China, where um, pupils were being monitored to see if they're paying attention or getting bored and so on. And in the last case here, I call it social manipulation. On the left, what we see is the Cambridge Analytica case that I mentioned earlier, which is probably the best known of um, uh, many kind of data manipulation cases. In this one, in this case, I wouldn't even say it's particularly an AI case because it was a relatively simple data analysis from what I understand. But what they managed to do was gather huge amounts of social profile data from Facebook and then use that to tailor, um, among other things, political ads uh, in to support to provide their clients with a, a service and their clients included the um, uh, Trump campaign uh, for his first election and also the leave campaign for Brexit and it's hard to say how much influence that particular uh, incident had but if it even moved the political needle a fraction of a percent that could have affected future history um, that's very uh, concerning. And then also we see here uh, t in the middle, 
Tay was the name of the AI that Microsoft launched on Twitter a few years ago. And unfortunately, um, within 24 hours, it had started becoming like a, uh, acting as a racist and rude agent. And more recently on the right here, um, Slovakia's elections um, were mired by deep fakes that I think were audio recordings that made um, certain politicians sound like they were saying things that they didn't actually say. And this year, as I speak, is 2024. This will be the biggest election year in history, I believe. Um, and we have to consider how important this kind of social manipulation could be, um, especially with new tools that have come out in the last uh, couple of years. It's also worth noting here that for better or worse, ethical sells. There is a great consumer demand for ethical products and services. And here are um, just some well-known brands that are um, that tell a story that is, you know, of, of an ethical nature, whether that's sustainability um, or health um, or so on. But even out of these six brands here, four of them are owned by major consumer goods companies who have had you know, questionable ethical um, interactions with the world and who sell products that um, are in the same kind of categories like, uh, you know, confectionery and cleaning products and so on that don't have the same um, ethical claims as the ones uh, that you know we're buying. And likewise here, um, considering our choice of Apple versus Android when we're buying a smartphone, we all have stories that we tell ourselves for better or, better or worse about why we uh, are a fan of one or the other. And one common story for people who go for Apple is that it, um, Apple treats your privacy more seriously and allows you more options to protect your data. Whereas Android fans will often say that the Android platform is more open and they are able to uh, hack it and change it um, and adapt it more to their needs. So in these cases, your values here could be that you're, you value privacy um, more greatly over the agency to manipulate your world around you. But in amongst all the values that we consider, I think most modern people, most people would uh, put somewhere high up that list, if not at the top, um, sustainability and a care for the planet. In which case, why don't we all have Fairphones? Fairphone, the brand, um, are supposedly the more ethical choice um, in terms of um, human practices like fair trade and sustainability, like um, allowing you to, to adapt the phone, um, you know, rather than just having to throw bits away. And yet, uh, a lot of people have never even heard of this brand. So we do have to consider how, regardless of what the kind of ethical stance is, uh, market forces can end up winning. And we as consumers can also tell ourselves stories that override the ethical values that we think we believe in. So now we move into the last section of the talk. What I want to do now is summarize what I see as the kind of key factors of modern business and innovation practice. And very much in summary here, um, what we see is that these days, every business is a startup. Even uh, multinationals with thousands of employees tend to treat their individual projects and departments uh, as very much being in startup mode, where they go out, they stay agile, they look for evidence, um, and they adjust as they go. And we have frameworks for this that are very popular at the moment, such as the Lean framework and Agile, and there are many more. Um, we also work in rapid iterative loops. Uh, one well-known loop, for instance, is the build, measure, learn loop, but there are loads. And they all essentially follow uh, something similar to the scientific method, where you generate an experiment about your um, what you think your product or service could do in the world. You find, find a way to test that as quickly as possible and measure the data. You learn from that and then you go again. And as such, we try to maintain a kind of open experimental mindset to the extent that instead of deciding what our target customer looks like and what their needs are like or um, deciding what product we're going to build we do instead now go talk about a process of discovery customer discovery product discovery where we throw away our assumptions and let the data 
uh, and reality lead us to what uh, we actually should build and do. And so to kind of expand this out a little bit, what I've done is I've created what I call uh, business superpowers. So these are just broad kind of core attributes um, of what I believe uh, good uh, business looks like these days. First of all is empathy. Now, if you think about what business is all about at a very simple level, whether it's say um, running a shop, a kiosk at the end of your road, or running a multinational technology company, ultimately what you're trying to do is you're trying to get into the head of your customers. You're trying to wear the other person's shoes as it were, or see the world through their eyes. And then if you can do that, you can then work out what kind of uh, product and service uh, they would want and how you would package that up, like price um, and you know um, design and so on. And then therefore they should uh, find that acceptable and you should be a successful business. So this is just basically a process of empathy. Empathy being about feeling into other people's minds and feelings and lives and so on. And so you can think of it as like a kind of lens, a customer lens. And you can apply this lens to every part of your uh, business, whether that's market research or pricing or branding or communications or design. Secondly, business superpower two um, is humility. So in modern innovation, um, what we do is we ban assumptions and we try to maintain this experimental mindset that I mentioned. We try to find out the real reasons why things happen, not um, ones that we just uh, have come from our own worldview. And that doesn't just apply to our customers in the market, but it could apply, for instance, to our staff and our fellows. Um, for instance, instead of just blaming somebody for screwing up, you try to look into why the problem happened in the first place. Look at the system rather than the person. Try to get outside of your own mind. Try not to put yourself in the way. Lead from the back. And business superpower number three, I'm gonna present this one slightly differently. Diversity and equality and inclusion, they're major trends these days in business. Um, that's largely a good thing, uh, although there can also be whitewashing where, you know, basically organizations are just ticking boxes to make it look like they care about diversity and equality and inclusion. But even if we take a kind of cold business perspective, I think it's worth pointing out here that the research stands behind the idea that diversity can actually improve performance in teams. High performing teams tend to be the ones that are sort of sensitive to how different everyone is. And I think this is exemplified brilliantly in, the, in this study that I'm, I'm, I'm showing here, that I'm citing here. And I'm just gonna read it off the screen again because um, I think this is a really good example. And this is uh, uh, something that was released quite a few years ago by MIT and Carnegie Mellon, uh, Carnegie Mellon, two very re reputable universities and reported in uh, Science, you know, a major journal they talked about the key factors to group intelligence. And they said, in two studies with 699 people working in groups of two to five, we find converging evidence of a general collective intelligence factor that explains a group's performance on a wide variety of tasks. This C factor is not strongly correlated with the average or maximum individual intelligence of group members. So just to clarify that, you could have one really intelligent person in your group, or in fact, the entire group could be of high intelligence, and that doesn't seem to improve things much. And it also says it is correlated with the average social sensitivity of group members, the equality in distribution of conversational turn-taking, and the proportion of females in the group. So it seems to suggest that in general, if you allow an environment in which everybody feels that they can participate, even if they're not necessarily specialists or um, don't, aren't considered to be of you know, particularly high uh, you know, intellect or whatever in the group, you can still get to a better answer. Another way um, I think that this has emerged in recent years is through a theme called psychological safety, which is also worth looking up but they both seem to have the same idea. It's this sensitivity to everybody else and allowing people to, allowing space for people to contribute on their own terms. And our last business superpower here is loops. We've talked about this already, but I think it's worth reiterating that modern business works in quick steps 
where we go round on ourselves, we gather evidence, we um, reapply it. And we can do this not just to build new things and to develop uh, and to keep moving forward, but also to maintain things such as to maintain quality through checks and whatnot, to maintain our ethics, in fact, and do te a test um, if they're still applying in the, in the work that we're doing, or to maintain value. And it's also worth pointing out here this theme, uh, this idea of cadence. Uh, if you consider um, bike racing, for instance, bicycle racing, they talk about trying to maintain a high cadence. That is, rather than sprinting and then slowing down again, you get up to a speed that you're able to, um, to hold, a uh, sort of rhythm that you're able to hold, and then you'll win the race. That's the idea. And so this is applied to business, and it's done on a sort of day-to-day -day level, the cadence that you can achieve through your individual day, but also through a week, through multiple weeks in what could be called uh, product sprints, and even over months and years. This uh, everything working in loops, you want to get each of your loops up to a cadence, high cadence that you can maintain. Okay, to summarize our business superpowers just quickly, we have number one is empathy, which is about uh, generating a customer lens through which you can see the world. There's humility, in which we all try to uh, operate like scientists and explorers. There's diversity, where we want to nurture social sensitivity and psychological safety. And there's working in loops where we follow the data, we iterate, and we try to obtain or achieve cadence. So with all that in mind, what does ethical innovation look like? Well, we have these ethical frameworks we've talked about. So where do we apply them? Which part of the organization and the product development process do we apply them? And here I've kind of split an organization up into three broad levels. That is of tools, tools being the technologies that you use, that's like hardware and software and so on, as well as the kind of workflows that you apply and the processes that you um, create uh, to, to do your day-to-day -day work. One step up from that is strategy. So this is where you're talking about planning, you're talking about operations, you know, which staff you should hire, how you should form your teams together, and also on day-to-day -day how you should direct the organization. So this is a kind of forward facing kind of idea. And then above all of that is this hard to grasp concept of culture. And culture can be manifest in things like the training that you do, uh, the way that you communicate um, between your staff and yourselves or with the outside world, and the stories that are told, not just the story that you attempt to tell as an organization, but also the real story that emerges from the way uh, your staff and your products and uh, the consumers kind of see you as actually existing. So which one of these is most effective for us to apply our ethical thinking to? Well, to quote the godfather of modern innovation practice, Peter Drucker, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So here he wasn't saying that strategy is meaningless or unimportant. <clears throat> He's very much a strategic guy, but he was saying that if you get the culture part right, the other bits might look after themselves or at least can, can follow more easily. So culture seems to be the right way uh, to, to point our, our efforts. And I would go a step further and say that strategy eats tools for breakfast, where um, I've interviewed lots of uh, leaders of pioneering businesses, and almost every one of them, when asked about what tools they used, seemed almost sort of put off by the question because they're not that interested in the individual tools and the way they're applied, so much as they're interested in how their people are doing and where the organization can be directed over time. However, all three of these levels really, in reality, have their place. You see, because tools can quantify um, things and they can be automated in ways that strategy and culture just simply can't. Strategy can predict and it can direct and it can look forward. And culture can create a kind of ownership and it can adapt in a sort of organic way that is very hard to uh, predict and manage, but also uh, can be quite powerful um, in its own way. So what I've done here is tried to apply all this to a very high level kind of plan. So if we work from sort of top left to bottom right, what we have is um, these ethical frameworks we've talked about can be used as kind of ethical lenses through which we um, think about uh, what we're going to do. We can then apply structure to them. So that's things like policies or protocols, you know, do this, then do that, 
or rules. Don't do this, do do that, and so on. And then these structures can be implemented in various ways, and there are plenty of uh, methods for implementation, such as compliance, um, conforming to standards, assigning roles and responsibilities, and so on. And as we've seen, we can apply this kind of ethical lenses and all the structures and implementation um, uh, factors into uh, any level of the organization, and we should try to apply them to all levels. And then we should apply this iterative development that we've talked about, working in loops. And in theory, through doing that and gathering our evidence and starting again, um, we should be able to work all the way through the company and product life cycle um, and not sort of lose our way. So to give us some sort of takeaways from the talk, um, we have these four business superpowers of empathy, humility, diversity, and loops. And we have this idea of ethical lenses. That is, um, there's no one ethical framework that always wins and they can be applied to any and all levels. But we try to find ways to help um, ourselves to operationalize ethics and then to iterate again and again. To finish then, let's try to bring all this together and present ethical innovation in a nutshell. Put simply, I believe that we can be innovative. We can move fast and build things that will have an impact on the world while also being ethical. Now we've seen from this talk about how we have the different theories, the frameworks from ethics that can give us lenses through which to think about the world. And we had the example here of the thought experiments that we looked at or even the case studies. These are all tools of which we can apply these frameworks to create a lens through which we look at things. And there's plenty of other ways of doing it too. For instance, you could create uh, checklists or you could create a set of questions that you ask or you could do workshops. I think what you should do is gather up all these different ways of um, taking ethical frameworks and applying them as lenses to practical situations and keep them in your back pocket and practice them wherever you can. And you can apply them to anything you're doing, whether they're, um, you're trying to develop new skills or capabilities or deliver a, you know, something for a client or whatever. And then we've also looked at what superpowers we can develop to be good at modern business and innovation. So the idea is to try and bring these ethical lenses together through our business superpowers and keep nurturing both and apply them to any level of the organization. And this is what the best businesses do. And this is what consumers are asking for more each year. And I believe we can use this kind of approach to build our way to a better future. Thank you. Now you can, if you wish, um, you can watch a video that my friends and I made. Uh, it's just four minutes long. Um, there's a link here to it. This one I will note, um, it sort of gives you a nice broad kind of poetic overview of why AI needs ethics. Um, but uh, I will say that it's focused more on the idea of machine ethics, that is encoding human ethics into machine systems than it is on the wider AI ethics concept. And I'll leave you here with a few links uh, to some further reading and also don't be afraid to get in touch. Thank you.